Welcome to Que Sara Sara, a podcast hosted by me, Sarah Ann Lalone. Join me as I go straight to the sources of my curiosity. Each episode, I get to discover or rediscover everyday educators as we discuss their passions and their projects. Listen in on our conversation and let our words spark imagination and inspiration. You're listening to episode 86 with Dee Lanier. How to use solvent time in your classroom tomorrow. All right. Good afternoon, Kesara Sara listeners, and welcome back to the podcast. Today, I am speaking with an educator who I, we were just talking about this, basically cold called on Twitter to come and chat with me because he has a really stinking cool project that I thought I should share on the podcast for you. So his name is D and D. Here we go. I forgot to ask you how to pronounce your last name because here, if if you were in Canada in the French speaking region, we would probably I say Lanier. Lanier is how I want to say it. But I will just let you say your name so that I don't I don't butcher it. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, funny story. My mother and I um, visited France years ago, and when we were there, we got a hotel, and the um, person in the front said. Yeah. How do you spell your last name? And we spelled it out and he said, oh, Lanier. And she said, no, it's Lanier. Mm-hmm. He says, no, it's French. Oh, Lanier. It's Lanier. So Lanier is what I go by. I would have never, ever, ever <laughs> got that one. So as soon as you press record, I'm I learning. Thought, I'm learning. Minute. That's the one thing we didn't yeah. talk about in advance. I bet you she's going to say Lanier. And I wouldn't be offended. Yeah, it's just it. You know what? It rolls off the tip of the tongue both ways. So, okay. um, <laughs> I have D here. He's clearly awesome. <laughs> he accepts whatever kind of uh, last name I'm going to throw <laughs> at him. He is an energetic educator, and he is currently a mentor for the Dynamic Learning Project and director with EdTech Team Canada. He is based all the way down south in Charlotte, North Carolina, this evening. And uh, the reason why I ask him out of my, uh, I want to say out of my curiosity, I had seen a, a tweet go out about this really neat resource called Solvent Time. And um, we are going to jump, we're going to take a deep dive into that today, I'm sure. Um, but before we get into that project, D, how is it going on this uh, Monday afternoon? Things are doing really well. Uh, the temperature is finally lowering a little bit. So here down south in the United States, it's been hot. So it's finally cooled off a little bit. And um, since you reached out, you know, got to, I'm sure I know that you went on Solving Time and like found a bunch of stuff about it and found some stuff about me. And of course, I looked and found some stuff about you and I was like, oh, wait a minute. We both love coffee, so we have to talk about this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so just to let you know, my level of coffee love goes to the extent of I, I roasted my own coffee this afternoon. So I roast coffee. Oh, and uh, yeah. Can you like, can you send some up north? I can send you like a self-addressed <laughs> box. What kind of, what kind of coffee is like North Carolina's, North Carolina, North Carolina earth? Uh, what do you call you? What do you call yourselves? Um, so, North all right. So you got to know this about me. I'm, so- I'm actually from Los Angeles, <laughs> California. Oh my. Uh, and I will never claim anywhere else because that's where I'm from. But North Carolinians. North Carolina. Um, <laughs> as is an English yeah, lesson North- here too. <laughs> yeah. 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 North Carolinians. Yeah. They, you know, we, we all drink coffee imported from other regions. Um, okay. But when I roast my coffee, I normally roast a coffee from uh, Ethiopian Yiddishafe, which is a higher region, mountainous region in Ethiopia. Uh, there's a nice Ethiopian grocery store around the corner for me that I like to go and get my green beans and I roast um, using an old oh. school popcorn popper. Let it set for about three or four days and have some fresh coffee. That is absolutely amazing. Do you have a tutorial or a video on YouTube that explains how to do that? I feel like I should make one. I should make one at this point. (laughs) Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I have just gone into like the, the French press kind of stages. As a new teacher, I also can't afford any fancy equipment, but hey, if I just need a little popcorn roaster, we're all set. Yeah, yeah. 
There's um, <laughs> this is like a uh, a completely unashamed plug for a book that a friend of mine is the editor of, uh, Mari Venturino. She uh, she's actually come up with three different books on fueled by coffee and love. I think that you should mm. interview her next. I'm just just saying okay. that or somewhere down the line. Yeah, well, I you know what? When we were talking on Twitter, just DMing back and forth, and we were talking about coming up with the problems, and you said, "Well, you know, anything about coffee or podcasting?" I said, "D, we're gonna get a line. Let's go. We're gonna get along just swell. Yep. We're just gonna get along so so good." <laughs> so, um, and not only do we have you know podcasting and coffee in common, but we also have education in common, that's and that's right. like clearly one of the reasons as educators why um, I, I want to just chat with you. So maybe you can give us your very, uh, very clever EDU oh. bio. Like who, who are you? What is, what is your thing? What are you known for? What are you passionate gotcha. about? What is your story? Whatever road you want to take, go ahead. <laughs> Got you. Well, you use the word clever, so I feel like I have to pull out yeah. the tagline and I call well. myself a sociologist turned technologist and mm-hmm. an equity enthusiast. So I used my curriculum when I was a content um, specialized teacher just to really teach character ed and get to know my kids and help prepare them for the world and real world circumstances. That was literally my story and I'm sticking to it, but I've I, I taught for six and a half years in alternative school, high school setting. Um, I was a business teacher. I had no business teaching business. I was lateral entry. Um, I fell in love with my kids, fell in love with the profession of education and um, couldn't get out, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And um, later started pursuing some certifications in technology training. So I was sort of the in-house technology instructional coach at our school. Uh, And then after a few years of doing that, I ended up going to another school and being their full-time tech coach there and implementation coach, working with the lower school primarily, and then helping bring G Suite or Google Apps to the entire school. And that's when I really started Mm -hmm. to deeply explore uh, the broader context of educational technology. Um, I headed up a nonprofit for a couple of years, continued to do professional development for schools, and then um, went back to the classroom for a couple of years and was a Mm. STEM specialist. Um, So I was able to do technology coaching for the teachers, but I was then working directly with kids again and and just being reconnected to my primary passion, which is uh, the kids. And then- um, Of course, yeah found out about this thing called the Dynamic Learning Project through good friend Jenny McGuera, who reached out, said that uh, there's a partnership with Google and Digital Promise and um, EdTech team, and we're looking to transform education as it currently stands in trying to meet what we call the second level of the digital divide. So the first level of digital divide, many people are familiar with, kids not having technology or having access at home. Right. The second level is schools being inundated with technology, but teachers just using them as tech replacements to old school, uh, ineffective pedagogy. Mm. So that was like speaking my language big time. Um, So being kind of called up to that mission was easy for me. Uh, It was hardest leaving the classroom and leaving my kids, but it was easy to move into a sector that I believed in so greatly. And so now this is year three of helping run and lead the dynamic learning project along with other colleagues. Wow. So can, what does dynamic learning mean? What does that uh, like insinuate for the project? That's just one thing I, I was trying to make the the link to. Yeah. Gotcha. So it speaks to several dynamics, pun Mm -hmm. (laughs) intended there, (laughs) right? It's the partnership. (laughs) between these three entities that bring their own form of specialization to the program. You know, EdTech team, which does professional development and training uh, and really does support for schools uh, globally. And then you have Digital Promise that does lots of things, but the thing that they bring to this particular project or program is the research research component. Um, 
And then you have Google for Education. I'm not sure if you've heard of them. They're this small little company out of California. That's a joke. Uh, so we all <laughs> kind of partner up. So there's the there's the dynamic of the partnerships, uh, and then there's okay. the dynamic of um, really seeing effective change in the use of technology coming from coaching, and so that being the research proven approach yep. of coaching teachers. Then from there, yeah. teachers implementing in their classrooms, and then also culture change happening throughout the entire school, and that culture change affecting the relationship with the school community and the outside community, including parents. And so there's this ripple effect also from this coaching aspect. And my job as a mentor is I mentor uh, 30 some odd tech coaches throughout the United States to help them in their jobs. So they have challenges as they are helping their teachers through their challenges. That's a mouthful. I know I gave you a lot there. Yeah, that is, can, uh, do you want to switch? I would love, love, <laughs> love, love, love. You can come teach my, um, I'm teaching an English class on a science class this semester. So in grade nine and 10. That's what so, I wanted to know. Yeah. Grade nine and 10, awesome. Grade nine and 10 in a, in a French Catholic high school, in a little rural high school, very, uh, a small, I think we're about 200 students. So everybody knows everybody. Uh, everybody's basically yep. family in some, in some way. Um, so yeah, it's really amazing. And I've had the same group of students last year and this year. So when you were talking about just like building like relationships with the students and getting to know them, um, I teach students with learning disabilities. So I have, um, well, all different ki- types of learning. So I really, yeah have like a strong bond with them because at the Mm. beginning of of last year when I, it was literally my first year teaching. Um, and I think I just got so lucky having them, uh, kind of as my, my, the first students that I had in front of me on my first day. And it was, it was really an amazing bond that I started building with them, you know, in 2018, 2019 school year. So this year has just been absolutely incredible with them. It's been really, really, yeah. Um, so you and said English. we're lucky we're also yeah English so because all of our classes in my school are in French English yep. is the only like English class gotcha. <laughs> that we teach gotcha. so and was there yeah. another content area um, that she said that she taught I teach science, science. Um, gotcha. it is not my specialty I'm I went to teachers college and got my certification in you know at the end of 2018 and literally well it was June 2018 uh-huh. Um, in grade four to grade 10 teaching English, like very basic. That was what I left with and got hired for a September f- full-time position and starting my second year in that same kind of full-time contract. So awesome. it's been a, it's been a really, uh, just a zero to a hundred, right? You get out of <laughs> yep. teacher's college here in Canada. It's two years after doing like a for your degree, mm. do two years teachers college, do some placements, kind of see what it's like. And then you're on your yep. own. <laughs> Here are the keys. Here are the kids. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> and science isn't one of my teachables. And I think having different classes, right? Like they don't necessarily prepare you to mm-hmm. learn, you know, the whole grade nine and 10 science curriculum with adaptations mm-hmm. and this and that. And so what I use Twitter for a lot of the time is to like not only for my own professional development, but to certainly find resources to help amp up my teaching, right? At a certain point, I am just always constantly like on the lookout for strategies or resources or just cool things that work and that can get my students who are sometimes not, you know, the most motivated to come to class want to be there. There If, If I can get them at least willing to be there, there Step you go. One, you know. <laughs> there you go. Have you heard of so, solving time? <laughs> I created it for classroom teachers like Well, you. <laughs> that's awesome. Totally unbelievably stumbled upon it. I don't even remember how. I wish I had a cool story, but I don't. It was there. I signed up. Yes. I got it all. I said, "Who was the creator?" D sent my tweet here and here we are. So what I did find with Solving Time is that it was formerly Smashboard yes. EDU. And it was a part of your Google Innovator correct. project, right? That is is that correct. true? Okay, tell so tell you more. <laughs> why don't you tell me like 
Yeah. The who, what, the who, what, why, like mm. who was it for, you know, what was, what was Smashboard yeah. EDU and, you know, yep. what is it now and why did you, you know, why was this gotcha. your Google Innovator project out of everything <laughs> in the world that you could have done? Okay. Well, I can start off by saying Smashboard EDU started out as a convoluted mess and it was awesome. Uh, and and okay. it was a convoluted mess because I was creating it with kids, right? So uh, using the design thinking process and really just putting a resource before the kids and then having them give feedback and having them help recreate instructions and things like that. Um, so what it started out as was an app smashing process. I mean, that was really its only aim was to app smash, like right? take, you know, take one app, mm. uh, you know, what's a popular Flipgrid is super popular now, right? So let's, let's app smash Flipgrid with a story bird and what could you create and really was around encouraging creative thinking and um, just keeping kids okay. on their toes. But I found a <laughs> major difference between when I taught Smashboard EDU or when I utilized Smashboard EDU with kids versus when I showcased it for professional development or at summits and events. Teachers struggled a lot with not having more clear instructions, having a sense of end in yeah. mind, right? They're like, they're wanting to translate it to their curriculum. And there was there were a few people yeah. that were, you know, willing to take risk and, and try something brand spanking new. And there were many who were just, I could just read the confusion in the room. And I'm thinking to myself, guys, just trust me, third graders love this. And they're like, help me out, throw me a mm -hmm. bone here. So then I started tweaking it more with the educator in mind, knowing that they're the ones that are responsible for implementing it. And with it being my Google Innovator project, that was the whole point was to create a project that I believed that could help transform education and kind of had to justify, well, what, what's the why behind it? And um, okay. it, it evolved. So, I mean, I think if you were to do some Google, Google searches, you, you could find some really old school stuff that it went from just app smashing to then a digital placement board. So then that's why it was, it was, it was sort of a blend between HyperDocs, a digital game board design with app smashing. And as it began to mature more and more, um, I began to begin to line it up more with the design thinking process since I was so heavily influenced by it and I was utilizing it. So then yeah. as I was teaching kids, I thought, what if I were to use this process um, and use the process of Smashboard EDU in conjunction with the process of design thinking and just constantly going back to the drawing board to make it better, so to speak. And eventually it, it became a product which was printable that could be used, that it had a systemized step-by-step -step process, but still allowed, still allowed the freedom at the end for this hyper creativity to be shared for an innovative solution to whatever problem or challenge was first identified. So it's kind of how it got from where it started to where it is today. And that was just uh, three years ago at this point. Okay. So if people listening are wondering, okay, D, is this applicable for my grade threes, but is it also applicable for my, you know, grade 11 biology class? Is that something that can translate into both contexts? Absolutely. So what it is, is it's design thinking and problem-based learning combined. So that is its sort of root, <laughs> uh, but it's also gamified. So um, the question that I always ask, so I'll ask you, how about we do this? Can we play around? Let's do it. All right. So, uh, and you teach science. Um, so I know it'd be easier to choose English because you felt you have a lot more confidence there and competence, it sounds like, but let's, mm -hmm. let's, let's play with science because this is where the struggle begins. Right. And, okay. uh, we'll blend a little bit of my role of, of being a mentor <laughs> with the DLP. Um, let me ask you, what is a current challenge that you are experiencing in your classroom with your science class in particular? Ooh, okay. I got one already. All right. Let's well, go. I have two. I have two. Can you, do you want to pick what one could 
is like the most juicy problem? We can only aim to solve one problem at a time. <laughs> so yes, let's let's choose which one, maybe which one you think your listeners would re- would relate to the most. We'll we'll try okay. that. Um. So I think that I have a hard time, or my students lack um, that curiosity, that desire, mm. or willingness to like know more about something Mm. or, you know, curiosity, like asking themselves questions, that kind of, Mm. well, that's what curiosity would be. Right. So yeah. Right. 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 Oh, that's Mm -hmm. interesting. So we are on a podcast, so we're going to have to do this completely audible or audibly. (laughs) Uh, So this will be interesting. So let's, let's all, let's imagine we're in Mm -hmm. your classroom and we've broken your classroom into small groups of groups of three or four. And you come in the room and you say, guys, we're going to try something brand new today. It's a game of sorts. Are you ready? Right. So you've kind of set the Mm -hmm. tone a little bit. And on the desk are these cards. And you have uh, maybe a presentation that's up that says, do not flip the cards yet. This is going to be fun. (laughs) Yes. So I'm already grinning group, ear to ear. Like I want to, okay, let's do it. Okay. <laughs> and on my desk, literally, as we're talking, I have my cards out. So this is not just play play. This is for real. Um, <laughs> and so I have six cards sitting on my desk. The first card says SOS. The second one says problem. The third one says research. The fourth one says understand. The fifth one says solve. And the sixth one says share. And I've shuffled the cards, so I don't, I don't even know which card is sitting on my desk. So if you and I were at one of these desks and we were working together, we're listening for these instructions. And then you, Sarah, would say, okay, let me give a little bit of explanation. We're going to go step by step, and we're going to have limited time in order to solve a real-world problem. Are you guys ready? And they're like, yeah, I guess. Because they're still like not really sure what you've set them up for. Yeah. But I'm also thinking as a teacher, you can have, you could take advantage of this process by connecting it to your content. So I heard that you're teaching biology. Is that correct? I'm not teaching biology right now. Oh, the unit gotcha. I'm working in, oh, I was like wondering for biology if it was uh, transferable, like the game, yes, uh, like yes. in a biology context. But um, I, my unit right now is actually like science, everyday science, just seeing how Every- science, af- yeah, how science like affects our lives, essentially. Got you. So how mm-hmm. science affects our lives. Um, I let's let's take a lightweight one, maybe pollution, let's say air sure. quality, right? Let's yeah. start with a problem. Um, I'm sure you have many others that you can come up with immediately. Mm-hmm. Okay, back to our imaginative scenario. Uh, the instructions are being given and you say, the first card I want you to notice is the SOS card. That SOS card, if you flip it over, want to remind you that during this process that you can always ask someone else Look at other resources like your class notes or whatever that um, we've been using in our class. And you can search online. You have permission to do those things. Now, if you are still stuck and you are desperate for help, your team has to agree to raise this card. And then me as a facilitator, I'll come over and I will help you. And then I will take your card. So use it wisely. Mm -hmm. All right. See how we've set up the game already? Yeah. Um, and this is where I'm wanting to build the intrigue by creating the context for this curiosity to sort of live. And then we say, okay, we're going to start with a real world problem. In our unit of study, we've been talking about science and how it affects our daily lives. And let's deal with um, one issue that is common right now. We hear a lot about on the news, and that's, that's about air quality. So that is our problem. Everyone clear that your problem relates to air quality? And I'm looking for nods and the answer is yes. Say, okay, now we're going to set a timer. And as a facilitator, I want to give as much time as I think is necessary. Uh, But I want them to be able to complete this process at least once within a given class period. So 15 minutes for a speed round, 20, 25 minutes if you were wanting to. Uh, give it a little bit more time. And I want to give time, if possible, to hear what each team comes up with as a solution. Right. 
Are we okay. good on our instructions so far? I'm intrigued. I'm ready. I'm All not right. I'm not you All know right. keener at the front. <laughs> All right, good, 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 good. Okay, so now you and I are going to be teammates because we have our cards in front of us, and I'm going to be the note taker, and I'm going to ask you to be the primary person to give me answers. Are you good with that? Sounds like a plan. All right, and we're going to do this as real play play. We'll set a you know five minute timer, and then we can talk <laughs> about it afterwards. Cool. Um, so five minute timer is going. First question. So um, we have to define this problem. What's the problem again? The problem is put um, it down as yeah, a sentence. The problem is a bad air quality in the world. Gotcha. Okay. Bad, bad air quality. All right. Uh, research card. I'm flipping it. It says, "Why did it happen?" Oh goodness! And it says research on the front, so we might need to refer to some of our notes or look online okay. for that one. Well, we obviously know that it is from the big industries. Are we talking? So as a naturally curious person, I'm, I, I'm asking, is this pollution in Canada? Is this the world? Is this the United States? Ooh. Are we, what are we focusing on? What do you want to focus on? All right. So yeah. So now we're back in the facilitator yeah. mode. Yeah. I would definitely make the problems as relevant as possible or focus my students to uh, think about the problem where it relates to them most. Okay. So yeah, let's say Canada. Okay. And, and even if they are something, if you're aware of this problem existing, even, you know, more regionally, let's mm -hmm. call it out. So let's just do Canada. And I have the answer to your question, the different oh, causes. It? So it is contributed by industrial and vehicular emissions, agriculture, construction, wood burning, and energy production here in Canada. That is the cause of our, of our air pollution. Did you just look that up? Of course. You said I could use research. I did. I did. The way that that came out, I was like, either she knows her content extremely well, or she looked that up. I was just curious, you know, because we're... <laughs> I was like, uh-oh, did, did I not follow the rules? Or <laughs> There's no such thing as cheating. <laughs> Let's there research. You go. Okay. We got three minutes left. We got to keep moving. Right. Okay. Next question. When did you first notice it? Ooh, um, probably when I was in high school when we first started talking about it in my geography classes. Oh, ah, so because I'm naturally curious. That awareness was brought. Ah, I got you. I'm yeah. thinking also like, do you ever see the air pollution? Do you smell the air pollution? Like right. when did it become real to you? Yeah, actually mm, at a very young age, because where I grew up in Cornwall, Ontario, um, they had a huge paper mill mm. and the air pollution, like it was bad and it smelled like rotten mm. eggs and you just never wanted to go in that end of town. And when the wind was blowing a certain way, you knew. Mm. So that, that, that's a great, great yep. one. Yep. All right. Just wrote it down. Okay. Next question. This is the solve card. It says, what are some things you need in order to solve it? This is tough because this sound like some really big players that are contributing to the problem. Mm -hmm. So what would we need in order to solve it? Yeah. We got two minutes, by the what way. Would we? Okay, so we as D and Sarah, or we as a country? Ah, w which one do you want to do? Because we would need like an action plan, yeah. you know, maybe provided by our government, more strict mm. rules on uh, what could you know what could D and emissions, Sarah do? Because that's a, that the big that's industry. Huge. What could D and <laughs> okay. Sarah do? Well, we could start by, you know, our own personal emissions. We could start by reducing them. First, we can reflect on like what kind of emissions we do, like just as human beings in our day-to-day -day lives and start by reducing our contribution to the problem. And then we can go and maybe raise awareness and talk about it in classes and schools with our colleagues mm. and stuff. So, I'm like wanting to come up with this like fun little slogan of like, I need another R word. Cause you said yeah. like knowledge and then reduce and then raise. I'm like, what's a, what's an R? Maybe it's like raise, I don't know. Uh, like respond to the problem. Ooh, or, um, yeah. Respond, reduce, like raise awareness, like a little chant. I don't know. Mm, I'm just being mm -hmm. silly here. Um, I love it. Okay. So less than a minute and this is the speed round. I'm going to flip the share card. Oh, and we just actually landed with song or speech. So I was probably on the right track <laughs> with this uh, 
respond, reduce, raise. Like we could have a little fun with that. Maybe yeah. uh, even throw some Got tech a in there. Boxing. Yeah. Ah, yeah, I was, yeah. yeah. I was thinking Incredibox. <laughs> you familiar with Incredibox? No, but tell me more. Uh, we could, it, it's, it's, digital beatboxing so we could put on some little incredible box come up with a little song and uh that would be fun yeah amazing yeah. play it on uh play it on our our speakers in the morning like when when people come in yes. for the announcements national anthem yes. and do our little little jingle <laughs> that would be awesome and guess what amazing. that was time that was five minutes of speed round of solving time that was so fun <laughs> Glad you like that. I'm just, <laughs> I just need time to like take it all yeah. in. So what are your questions now? No. Well, do, so everybody has the same problem, right? Um, if you want to make that the, the case. Um, so when I facilitate okay. it, I typically do, yes, I give everyone the same problem. Um, but it oftentimes depends on the maturity level of people that are playing as well, if that makes any sense. Um, but as a, mm -hmm. as an introduction to something in which is brand new, I like to level set things as much as possible. Um, so maybe we're all using the same problem and we may even, um, complete and share, which is that final step in the same manner. Yeah. So I may do that as, as a first run and then later i may make some adjustments and say okay it seems like the process is is well embraced and understood and everything is flowing well what if i give some options so i want to introduce some agency so maybe air pollution is you know in front of others in front of some but then i i select other issues or topics that have come mm -hmm. up in our class and give them the agency to choose from there. And then maybe also as okay. we, because I want them to keep, stay curious. It's, oh, this is a familiar process, but it continues to be adapted. And so I may then introduce, you know, a different way of sharing. Um, and so maybe go mm -hmm. from song or speech to one of the other ones, which could be, I can look at my cards, <laughs> um, skit or play, <laughs> story or poem sketch or poster right so the flexibility and adaptability mm -hmm. is really in the hands of the educator who can choose to facilitate it as they wish but knowing they're still following the same sort of step-by-step -step process yeah, yeah 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 absolutely and okay so for those because i've seen them yep. right and you know what yes. they look like and this is a podcast and people <laughs> are probably wondering like what this game actually looks That's like correct. and i don't want it's, it's not a game right you don't it's a it's yeah. it's an activity it's a game -ish. i don't like it's gamified it yes yes right yeah it's gamified yes. problem based is i'm thinking gamified all right. in one right. love it okay um it's fun it okay. has cards so, it feels like a game <laughs> yeah no i love it but what so what do those cards look like and if you want to go through like what the six uh process like what the six steps say just Absolutely. to uh I know that we we ran through them quickly in the yep. five minutes. I even like forget what they were. I, so. I was just way too excited about playing, so I even forgot to explain along yeah. the way. Yeah. So the so when people download them, like what are they yes. getting? So they're going to get the you. SOS cards. So they'll get three SOS cards. Um, it's worth noting that the free download will give you a PDF that can be uh, used to facilitate up to three groups. And if you're like, I need more then just print more. <laughs> right? Uh, so you'll get three of those SOS cards and you get three of the problem cards that on the, I call it my, the base pack. There's a little spoiler that maybe you and I can talk about here in a little bit. Um, but it just says, okay. what's the, what is the problem on the back? Um, so that's the problem card. The next step is the research card. It has glasses on the front. It's purple and it says, um, it has six different prompts on the back. So there are six different cards. Okay. That was one of my questions. Like how diversified is it? Like how many, yep, you know? Yep. So in the research section, as well as the understand section, which is next, there are six different who, what, when, where, why, or how questions. So it just kind of keep, keeps them going. Yeah. Um, so the next, mm -hmm. the next card is 
understand, as I stated before, it's blue. It has a magnifying glass in the front. And its aim is to help you understand the problem more. Like you may have sought um, some research. You might have you know, looked and found some facts about something. But then to take it a little bit deeper, I want to engage the empathy of the learner. And th- like that was that discussion you and I had about when you first experienced um, smelling the paper mill and the air pollution there, right? It was like, let's make this problem real which then moves into the next step, which is now finally we're going to attempt to solve this problem or discuss the solution to the problem. And notice the previous three steps, we all we've been doing is identifying it and seeking to understand it. But now we're going to go into, okay, solve. There are three different potential prompts, though there are six cards. Um, the questions there are, I'll just say those out loud. Uh, what are some things you need in order to solve it, which is what we did? How might you solve it in a new way? Or who are some people that can help you solve it? So it's making you think about the problem Ooh. and solutions in a different way every time. And then last but not least, let's okay. share this solution in a really fun way. Because I think if it's fun, then it'll stick. And uh so there are six cards there that are sketch or poster, story or poem, skit or play, uh, song or speech. And then there are two wild cards, if you will, and they are you choose cards. So if a group selects that, then they have complete choice of any of those other four. So that's the process. Hmm. Wow. This is just, it's so stinking cool. <laughs> um, oh, man. Okay. Because I was wondering to... If you need to necessarily necessarily um, prepare your students to to do this, or can I just walk in class tomorrow and be like, "Hey guys, <laughs> let's try this." Like, do you encourage just kind of throwing them in the deep end and seeing how they take to it, or is there like a before that I should or that you know educators right. should do? Well, I, I get questions like this so often. I really, really believe it comes down to the educator. It it, it comes down to you, Sarah, and your preference and your style. Uh, in your comfort level, because the person who has to stick with it most would be you, right? The kids, uh, for better or for worse, kind of have to do whatever you tell them to do. Because right. I'm wild and crazy like that. I already told you that Smashboard EDU, it started out as a hot mess and my kids loved it because it was a hot mess. I'm just like, let's just go. And then let's evaluate it afterwards. Mm-hmm. And then let's come back and try it again. But um, If you are aiming to kind of operate in an orderly fashion and get buy-in and you're kind of already reading that your kids don't trust that anything about your class is ever going to be fun, (laughs) then I think you (laughs) got to use your judgment there and say, okay, do I shock them and just do something they've never even heard of and say, you guys want to try something new or do I... um, you know, lead them into it. I, Ease them into it. Yeah, you, right? yeah, yeah. Some some people literally th- throw their I babies in, they... in pools. <laughs> I don't I don't understand those people, but they do. <laughs> yeah, they know that. Um... You know, in Madame Lalonde's class, my class, we uh, we do things differently, and we often just kind of try the the non traditional ways. So they would not be surprised. That's if awesome. I did that uh, to them, which you know what. All the better. Sometimes we do things that I haven't even tried before. And I I enjoy being the learner with them. So uh, that could be really fun. Um, Currently, right now, we're, we're, I'm trying to get them to ask questions Mm. about how things uh, kind of work, you know, in, in life. So recently we've, uh, we've discovered how, um, how our sound travel, like how mm-hmm. the sound of our voice travels. Mm. Um, we've discovered how our telephones connect with each other. Like if I'm talking to you, you know, on a, on a phone call, how our, our cell phones and cell phone towers yeah. work. Um, we've t- looked at radiation in our phones. We've been myth busters. Nice. We've tried to like look at uh, videos online. There was one where a really, really old video, there was a whole bunch of phones all calling each other with popcorn in the middle. I don't know if you've ever seen it. I have not, but I feel like this is something Um, I need in my life. (laughs) Yeah, well, there's like unpopped kernels and there's like old Blackberries and flip phones and they're all calling and all of a sudden the popcorn pops. (sighs) 
And um, because there are actual, and this is all things that I learned with my students, there are microwaves oh. in our in our in our cell phones, and so we were trying to see if you know, there was enough microwaves. If we all called each other, we had like 10 phones in the center That's calling. Crazy. If there was enough microwaves to pop the popcorn, which we, we totally busted. It uh, was a myth and my students had a lot of fun. That's awesome. I know. But the next day we made popcorn and we, yeah, really that's cool fun. See, it, so everyone was happy in the end. Is, there right? it is. That's awesome. <laughs> well, and you you spoke to it. I think the yeah, biggest so. thing an educator needs to do is pre-consider what problems do they want to solve and make sure that that problem is real mm-hmm. and relevant to the kids. And if you start there, then trust yeah. the process afterwards. Um, and, and and sometimes that can be the most vexing thing is to consider your content and to think through it and find what is the conflict here what's the in in your english class it's probably much easier because if you're looking at literature good literature always has a right. conflict so then you just pull mm-hmm. that conflict out yeah. <laughs> and you know we always have these com- conversations with our kids right and saying okay who can relate to this to this problem or this conflict and and we bring in our own real life in that now that's like the perfect setup for okay this is a problem that not only exist in this text, but exist in the world. How could we solve it? And, you know, that relatability and that fun factor jumps in from there. Science, it just okay. becomes, I think, more yeah. of the critical thinking of the educator first and say, hmm, mm-hmm. what are real world scenarios that these kids care about? And that's the key part. Right. Because if they don't care, they won't engage. That's pretty much the case. <laughs> Well, I think you just like a huge light bulb just went off in my mind because one of my questions was, so I teach science in French, obviously, yeah. and I was wondering if there are going to be, you know, French mm. cards in mm-hmm. the making, but it really doesn't matter because you just explained to me how I can use these cards in English right now in my <laughs> English class. Awesome. So the French cards can come when they, when they get here, no rush. They will come. <laughs> Maybe you can help me with that. But yes, if you look on the website, there's a translation section and um, had a very good friend translate a set of cards to Spanish from uh, Colombia. My friend uh, did that and then um, have another friend who is translating them in in French as well as in Creole and Haitian Creole. So those are coming. And then if other people want them in other languages. Oh, if you want a second look at the French yes. one. Yeah. If you want a second look on the French one, I can uh, give them a little check and send them off to uh, the Twitter world. Because a lot of my listeners are, are, are Francophone here. So I think that, um, at, well, any kind of free resource like this is uh, like, they're going to yes. jump on it, especially in French. So much, much, much appreci- appreciated. Um, before we go, yes. did you want to leave off with a little teaser um, mm. <laughs> for, yeah, for your project? Well, or can we, we can just leave on like a cliffhanger, you know, yes. check back on your Twitter in like a couple weeks if you want. Yeah. Um, be a good send off to like, let us know how to connect with you and stuff. So, yeah. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll throw a couple teasers out there. Um, okay. And I'll leave them open. I'll leave them open for interpretation. So, um, starting with a problem, oftentimes teachers ask that I help them and just give some example problems for students to solve. So, um, remember I'm a mentor for tech coaches. And so I, every day interact with instructional coaches and tech coaches that are helping teachers with regular everyday classroom challenges. So I have classroom challenges on my brain all the time. Um, Also because I'm a sociologist by background and I really do a lot of work specializing in equity. I think about equity work often, a whole lot. So I think about classroom challenges. Mm -hmm. I think about equity work. Uh, I love helping teachers who are really engaging students in their social emotional learning. So those are just a few of the things that I'm very passionate about and that I'm working on integrating with Solve in Time. So stay tuned for that. Oh, chills. So exciting. (laughs) 
So they're like, okay, D, I need to start following you so that when this stuff comes out, I can be the first to know. Yes. How can we connect with you? Either your website, the website for Solvent yes. Time, your Twitter, yes, all that yes, stuff. Yes, yes, So all the things, all the things. If you go on solventime.com, you kind of can find all of the things. Uh, definitely recommend just digging around, seeing what's all there. But if you sign up on the front of the website, mm-hmm. you receive the Solvent Time base pack to your inbox all you have to do is print cut and play have some fun Uh, there's detailed instructions on the website Uh, there's a link to um, the twitter handle for at solving time i do respond to dms apparently right (laughs) that's how we got Mm. connected on this (laughs) Um, but also yeah and just with twitter like you want people if they're using your product you know, your resource, um, to share it out and tag yes, you. Right. Please. Like, I think that's the best reward. Absolutely. Honestly, to see and if it I can, getting used. If I can ask the biggest favor, it would be educators, all educators who are listening to this, please showcase your students creative solutions. Um, I love seeing the kids mm-hmm. handling the cards and I'm just itching to see, did they create the song? Like, did they make the song about, um, reducing pollution like i want to hear it that would be amazing so kind of hearing some of those seeing some of those um seeing if it's really working if real solutions are happening i would love to use my power of collaboration it's like my own superpower and connect kids and educators to other um people Mm -hmm. and organizations that are doing work in whatever field they're most interested in. And so if they create a solution to the problem of homelessness, and I want to connect them to an organization that's also doing work with homelessness and things like that. So yes, let's interact on Twitter. I would love to do lots of that. Yeah. You you could even send out like a problem of the week where, you know, Ooh, all students great idea. work with one certain problem and then have to share back their answers with you. That could be interesting. That would be I'm excellent. Ready. Excellent idea. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that. Mm-hmm. You're welcome. <laughs> Look, we're collaborating already. already. I'm ready. I'm in. Can translate your cards, give you some problem <laughs> ideas. We're yeah. just raring to go. <laughs> Wait a minute. How did this turn into me doing all this work? <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> no, but like one thing that I'm, I just want to, I just want to ask you and kind of end with is that you must be so proud and it must be so like almost gratifying just seeing this project come to life and having so much interest it's, in it. Um, it's amazing. Like how lovely is it's that? It's amazing. Yeah. And it's kind of what drives me being told by educators um, and kids alike that it's worth it. Um, hearing this is so cool. This is so fun. Or uh, we're utilizing it or, or sort of the demand for more just says, oh, this is worth sticking to and continuing to do this because I, I really did start out with a passion of seeing education change. And I, I don't like boring lectures. Personally, I can't stand them. Mm. So what can we do to change that? Um, and I don't like being told the only way that I can reflect on my knowledge is by a written paper. Like, can I have a little bit of option here? Like, I'm a poet. Can I write a poem? Um, literally, yeah. right? I, I promise I'll put the content in there, I swear. And then, like, I'm a social justice advocate. So can we connect this to real world and, and all of those sort of things? So, yes, it's been absolutely amazing and i'm looking forward to seeing how it continues to grow especially from feedback wow ah, well it's been absolutely amazing d uh, just chatting with you and Same. picking your brain and like i feel inspired uh, right now i feel really inspired oh, so you. just want to <laughs> thanks for for taking the time to speak with me and as educators i know that our time and our energy is our valuable resources so um I just want to remind our listeners uh, that in this big, beautiful world of education, we we give what we can, we do what we can, and for the rest, que sera, sera. Que sera, sera is a proud member of the Voice Ed Radio Network. Original music, editing, and production of this podcast is done by the talented Mathieu Leroux. Find my podcast on all podcast platforms, including SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, And now, newly on YouTube. Talk to you soon.